Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Katie. I'm the pastor here at Grace United Methodist Church. So glad that you are joining us. Special welcome, everyone who is joining us online through Facebook. We're so glad you're with us this morning. Please feel free to comment, let us know you're here. And if you have any prayer requests, please let us know. We would be happy to add that to our prayer list and our prayer mailing. I wanna just let you know, for those who are here this morning, once again, thank you so much, not only for coming to worship, but for continuing to wear your masks and being so diligent about that. I wanted to let you know about two opportunities we have coming up as a special way to love your neighbor, love the community. First of all, just a reminder, even though we're not passing the offering plates, there's still a chance for you to financially support the work we're doing here at Grace. Just this week, I know our mission team delivered a huge van full of supplies to our neighbors at the International Institute to prepare for all of our new neighbors coming in from Afghanistan. We're continuing to support the work United Methodist Church is doing to help those areas in need, such as Haiti, hurricane relief, etc. All of your giving goes directly to support that. So there are two brown boxes, or someone finally gave me the great idea, we'll just put the offering plates up there on the altar and you can set your gift in at the end of service. Second, I wanna introduce Mr. Paul Durham, who most of you know is our friendly greeter, but he has a special announcement for us this morning. Okay, very quickly, I just want to uh, invite you all to participate in what we have, what's called a shed project. Um, we help uh, some people that live in University City, some usually elderly people, and we kind of help in their yard and that type of thing. So it is coming up on October 9th. Uh, it's a Saturday, and basically we work from nine to noon, so it's pretty quick and uh, we supply any tools that you might need or anything, but basically we work on, usually it's yard work. Uh, sometimes we fix a few things on the uh, outside of the house, that type of thing. So anyway, you'll see in your pastorgram, there'll be a sign up place that you can just sign up or you can sign up in the office or you can just give your name to me if you'd like to. So anyway, that's coming up. So put it on your calendar. If you are physically able to do that kind of work, we would sure love to have it. Thank you. So we are in a sermon series right now by uh, Courtney Ellis's new book called Happy Now. And I want to open with this quote that's going to kind of guide and center our time of worship this morning. An unhurried life invites joy. A soul at rest is open to blessing. So with that, I invite you to stand in body or spirit as we call one another to worship. Come and celebrate. Shout joyfully to the Lord your God. Glorify God with your praise. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in joyful songs. Come and see what our God has done, what awesome things God has done for us. Let the whole world bless our God and sing God's praises, for our lives are in God's hands, and God keeps our feet from stumbling.
You may be seated as we continue in this time of worship and especially of prayer. We're going to sing what I think is one of the most requested hymns that I get, but a chance for us to fall into the arms of grace and go to God in prayer as we lift up the words of Psalm 65 and rest our hearts and minds in the God of love. So let us go to God in prayer. Our God, you deserve praise in Zion, where we keep our promises to you. Everyone will come to you because you answer prayer. Our terrible sins get us down, but you forgive us. You bless your chosen ones, and you invite them to live near you in your temple. We will enjoy your house, the sacred temple. O oh God, you save us, and your fearsome deeds answer our prayers for justice. You give hope to people everywhere on earth, even those across the sea. You are strong, and your mighty power put the mountains in place. You silence the roaring waves and the noisy shouts of the nations. People far away marvel at your fearsome deeds and all who live under the sun celebrate and sing because of you. You take care of the earth. You send rain to help the soil grow all kinds of crops. Your rivers never run dry. You prepare the earth to produce much grain. You water all of its fields and level the lumpy ground. You send showers of rain to soften the soil and help the plants sprout. Wherever your footsteps touch the earth, a rich harvest is gathered. Desert pastures bloom and mountains celebrate. Meadows are filled with sheep and goats. Valleys overflow with grain and echo with joyful songs.
God, you are great. And we pause and give thanks for all the times that you have showered us with blessings and gifts and we've overlooked them because we were just in a hurry. For the gift of a beautiful day, the changing of the seasons, the colors of the flowers around us, the family and friends who love and support us. God, we stop and give you thanks. For God, without these gifts, it would be hard to get through this thing called life. And we lift up now, God, all of those people that are on our hearts that we love, that we know are struggling, who are afraid, who are awaiting news, who are worried, who are sick. Holy God, may your hand of peace guide and support all of those that we care about. And God, we pray for our church and what you have in store for us. Give us eyes to see and a courageous heart to follow. For God, you are doing a great thing in this place and we see it every time we go outside. The birds sing your praises. The flowers declare your glory all around, God. We see you are doing a good thing. So encourage us of that, even when the news makes us weary, even when school is hard and parenting is hard. God, we know you are great and you are doing a great thing. Help us remember to stop and to thank you for that. And so God, as we come to you now, holding in both hands both our joy and our concerns, we lay them before you as a gift on your altar, knowing, God, that your faithfulness will always be with us through all seasons. And so as one people, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand either in body or spirit as we affirm our faith together. We sing of God the Spirit, who from the beginning has swept over the face of creation, animating all energy and matter and moving in the human heart. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untainable who is creatively and redemptively active in the world. The Spirit challenges us to celebrate the holy, not only in what is familiar, but also in that which seems foreign. We sing of the Spirit who speaks our prayers of deepest longing and enfolds our concerns and confessions, transforming us and the world. We offer worship as an outpouring of gratitude and awe, and a practice of opening ourselves to God's still, small voice of comfort, 
to God's rushing whirlwind of challenge. Through word, music, art, and sacrament, in community and in solitude, God changes our lives, our relationship, and our world. seated. As we hear now our words from Scripture this morning, we go back to the very, very beginning, the first pages of our Holy Word, the story of creation from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was barren with no form of life. It was under a roaring ocean covered with darkness, but the Spirit of God was moving over the water. On the first day, God said, I command light to shine. And light started shining, and God looked at the light and saw that it was good. On the second day, God said, I command a dome to separate the water above it from the water below it. And that's what happened. On the third day, God said, I command the water under the sky to come together in one place so there will be dry ground. And that's what happened. God named the dry ground land. He named the water ocean. And God looked at what God had done and saw that it was good. On the fourth day, God said, I command lights to appear in the sky to separate day from night, to show the time for seasons and special days and years. I command them to shine on the earth, and that's what happened. And God looked at what God had done, and it was good. On the fifth day, God said, I command the ocean to be full of living creatures. I command birds to fly above the earth. And God looked at what God had done, and it was good. On the sixth day, God said, I command the earth to give life to all kinds of tame animals, wild animals, and reptiles. And that's what happened. God made every one of them, and he looked at what had been done, and it was good. Then God said, now we will make humans, and they will be like us. We will let them rule the fish, the birds, and all other living creatures. So God created humans to be like God. God made man and woman, gave them a blessing, and said, Have lots of children. Fill the earth with people. Bring it under your control. Rule over the fish in the ocean, the birds in the sky, and every animal on the earth. God looked at what God had done. And all of it was very good. Evening came, and then morning it was the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything else was created. And by the seventh day, God had finished God's work, and so God rested. God blessed the seventh day, made it special, because on that day God rested from the work. This is how God created the heavens and the earth. Our second reading takes us to the book of Exodus as we look into one of the Ten Commandments. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Work six days and do everything you need to do, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to God, your God. Don't do any work. Not you, not your son, not your daughter, not your servant, not your maid, not your animals, not even the foreign guest visiting you in the town. For in six days God made heaven, earth, and sea, and everything in. 
God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, God blessed the Sabbath and set it apart as a holy day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. do it in rehearsal upstairs I was clapping just as loud when they were done thank you choir what a gift it was my last year in seminary when I met my friend Nate I'm still a little surprised that we ended up being friends because Nate was kind of everything I was not he had been accepted into the PhD program he had won a prestigious fellowship he was married with kids he was active in his Mennonite church he was kind of the epitome of just having everything together. And let's just say at that point in my life, I was still working on getting everything together. 
One day, Nate decided to invite a group of us to lunch at his apartment. And I walk in, and the first thing I noticed was the smell of bread freshly baking. You could hear Gregorian chants playing in the background. And then everything about the space just made you go, oh, it was so peaceful and calm. If you've known me long enough, you know that sometimes in those situations, I tend to pull a Katie and completely disrupt the atmosphere. So into this moment of calm, I go, Nate, how the heck do you do it? I'm completely stressed out, and your life is just perfect. Now, there were other students with us, and they were all nodding in agreement. So I just want to point out that I was the norm, and Nate seemed to be the oddball in this situation. But Nate's response caught me off guard, so much so that it will still to this day kind of turn around in my mind from time to time. He said, my secret is that we rest. We take Sabbath really seriously in our family, and that's the foundation for our joy. Nate would go on to write his entire PhD thesis on this need for rest, especially in youth ministry. And so like all good nerds, as soon as it came out, I bought a copy and I, I devoured the book because I knew Nate wasn't just studying this idea, he embodied it. And I wanted it. I wanted to dive so deeply into God's invitation to rest so I could find that peace that could pass all understanding. Something that could wrap my weary soul and keep me safe through all storms. Problem is, and I'll admit it, I am really bad at stopping. I'm not ashamed to admit, I'm a woman who likes to get things done. And the problem is, society will reward me for that. You know, we turned in our paperwork two days early to the conference. Oh, the praises we got. I keep the house clean and my spouse adores me. But I realized all this work, all this accomplishing, all this overachieving, it's not translating to joy. And then along came a pandemic. And suddenly, last year, for the first time, I couldn't go to church. This peace that has been part of my identity for years was taken away. And next thing I know, I'm sitting on my couch in my sweatpants on Sunday morning, and I'm drinking my coffee slowly as I'm listening to the service. And in that moment, that peace that peace that I first had a glimpse of in seminary returned, which of course made me laugh because leave it to me to need a global pandemic to be reminded of something, but to know that life is not based on what we do, but to remember who we are and to take time to enjoy it. Eugene Peterson wrote our translation of the scripture today. He said, Sabbath is that time set aside to do nothing so we can receive everything. It's a time to pray and to play. And he points to the creation story as the foundation for this identity, right? God created it, and it was what? It was good, but it wasn't finished. A lot of other ancient narrative stories begin creation from the point of death, as in two gods were fighting, one died, and from their body the world was created. But our story doesn't begin with death. It begins with God giving life. We were created from dust, and to dust we will return, but in between. In between is an invitation to something that is good. And Karl Barth points out in the creation story, it's humanity that's marked as special. 
Humanity is the only thing that is blessed, that's addressed by God, created in the image of God, charged with filling and caring for the earth, but the story is not about humanity. In fact, the story really isn't about creation. Now, normally when we talk about the creation story, we start listing everything God did, right? God made the stars and the pine trees and the dolphins and the caterpillars on the wildflowers. And then the crowning achievement, God makes man and woman. It's big, wow, the pinnacle of all of God's hard work. But it doesn't say it is finished until day seven when God rests which doesn't quite work in my mind. If the work is done, then God's done. And that's where the story takes us further. Finishing and resting cannot be separated. God isn't finished until the divine act is complete, and the act is not producing things, creating the stars and the birds and the flowers. The divine act is a new relationship between the creator and the creation. And it all hinges on Sabbath. Because on the seventh day, we see the character of the creator. We see God's freedom. We see God's love. Because on the seventh day, God limits God's self. And God stops creating. God hands over the work. God's not held captive by this work anymore. God is free to enter into this relationship with the work, with creation. God, who's everywhere and over everything, suddenly now picks a spot and stops on day seven because God has found the object of God's love. It's us. And there's no need to work anymore. And God's resting brings this creation to completion, right? Creation is called good not because of what the creation accomplishes, right? It's good because the creator said so. And when God rested, so did humanity, even though they hadn't done anything yet. Can I tell you how many years I thought Sabbath is the reward for a job well done, but Adam and Eve haven't done anything yet? And that finally changed my life. Because I kept pushing Sabbath aside until the work was done. I mean, I don't want to brag. I kind of work on the Sabbath. It's part of my job description. I don't have time to stop. But the truth of Sabbath is God's work depends on God. It doesn't depend on me. Sabbath is just the invitation to enjoy it, to celebrate. In Hebrew, there is a word, kadosh, and it represents all of the mystery and all of the majesty of the divine. Do you get the weight of this word? It's only used once. God blesses the seventh day and calls it kadosh, calls it holy. All the mystery and majesty of who God is linked to God's resting. God's very identity, linked to, remember, made in the image of God, linked to the identity now of these people. And it filters all the way down. We finally come to the Ten Commandments. God says, here, I'm going to help you have fullness and health and life and love as you are these people that are in relationship with me. And so the first three commandments, answering the question, how do we love God? And God says, I am God, no one else. Don't worship anyone but me. Don't make idols pretending to be me, and don't misuse my name. Last six commandments. How do we love each other? Respect your father and mother. You don't murder. You're faithful in marriage. You don't steal. You don't lie. You don't want something that doesn't belong to you. The link, loving God and loving others, is commandment four. Honor the Sabbath and keep it kadosh, keep it holy. God is holy, so keep the Sabbath holy. 
It says, the Sabbath belongs to me. Now I command you and your descendants to always obey the laws of the Sabbath. By doing this, you will know I have chosen you as my own. Keep the Sabbath holy. You have six days to do your work, but the Sabbath is mine and must remain a day of rest. If you work on the Sabbath, you will no longer be part of my people, and you will be put to death. Every generation of Israelite must respect the Sabbath. This day will always serve as a reminder to me and to the Israelites, that I made the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day I rested and relaxed. See, now Sabbath is something more than just, well, this is good for you. Now Sabbath is an identity issue. It's central to the very core of what does it mean to be a child of God. And I love that God kind of acts a little bit like a snarky parent on this one, right? Remember, child, I made heaven and earth in six days, and I could still stop, so maybe you can too. And so we worship on Sundays, on our Sabbath, to remember who we are. Right? It's so much deeper than we go to church for an hour and the banks aren't open. No, Sabbath is the very foundation of grace. There's nothing we can do or earn or achieve for God to love us. And if we fail to enter into that rest, if we come up with thousand very convincing excuses on why we can't stop, it becomes more than a bad idea. It will literally deform our personhood and rot away what it means to be a human in the first place. Because in the beginning, our identity was not marked by what we accomplished. And in the end, it's not going to be about what we achieved. Because we were made from dust. And to dust we will return. So in between is an invitation to take time to create and to break, bake bread and to drink your coffee slowly, and to listen to your body and soul, to turn off your cell phone, to take a walk, to rest, to set aside time to do the things that you enjoy, whatever they are, without guilt, but see it as an offering, as a way to honor God and the very image of God within you. And so I requested this final hymn because I love it as that invitation. No matter where you are this morning, come and let us just rest in the arms of a God who loves you. I'm going to invite you as you're able to stand as we sing together.
I began the service by telling you that an unhurried life invites joy. A soul at rest is open to blessing. I pray that this week you take time to stop and to rest and to enjoy so that God can bless you with the little things this week, so that whatever comes your way, good or bad, you will know who you are and who you belong to and how much you are loved no matter what. Go and be blessed this week. And all of God's people said, Amen.